Thank you, Ambassador Chen. Next, I would like to invite uh, Secretary um, John Lee, Secretary for Security of the Hong Kong SAR government to address uh, the conference today. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, Mr. Lee is uh, Secretary for uh, Security. And before his appointment to the current uh, post in 2017, he served as Under Secretary for Security and Deputy Commissioner of the Police of Hong Kong SAR. Mr. Lee, please. Thank you, Minister Jiang, for the very kind introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to take this opportunity to share with you the latest account of Hong Kong. Before I do that, I would like to take you back to the time before June 2019. That is the time before Hong Kong was wrecked by violence. For those of you who have visited Hong Kong before then, you have witnessed in person that Hong Kong is a beautiful city representing efficiency, safety, opportunities, and vibrancy. Yet all these were shattered by the violence and disturbances which lasted for about a year since June 2019. The mobsters and rioters ruined the city and pushed it into an abyss. They smashed shops, restaurants, railways, and public facilities. They devastated the city by petrol bombs. Over 5,000 petrol bombs were thrown and more than 10,000 extra seized. They cruelly set a man ablaze with inflammable liquid. They killed a 70 year old man by hurling a brick at him. They seriously attacked innocent people who held different opinions. Some were even tied up and humiliated. Police officers were targeted, stabbed mm. by knives, poured with corrosive liquid, wounded by arrows, you name it. Six genuine firearms were seized, together with over 1,000 rounds of genuine ammunition. Heavy explosives with remote control devices were also found, similar to those used in terrorist attacks in other places. Mobsters brazenly displayed flags advocating Hong Kong independence. They preached what they called mutual destruction to jump off the cliff with Hong Kong. Some shameless individuals even incite fallacies such as to break the law to achieve justice. The Legislative Council building was stormed and seriously devastated. Foreign intervention was rampant with money, supplies, and other forms of support provided to the mobsters. What kind of people would destroy their hometown for mutual destruction? Which countries would tolerate such violence on their homeland? What have outside forces been doing here? One unfortunate fact is that Hong Kong itself has failed to close a loophole in the system which left its door open to national security threats. Despite having reunified with our mother country for over 23 years, Hong Kong has failed to carry out its obligation under the basic law, Article 23, to legislate to protect national security. This has created a vacuum. Certain external forces have exploited this vacuum to further their political gains at the expense of our national security and Hong Kong's interests. Some Hong Kong people colluded with these external forces and disgracefully called for sanctions against Hong Kong to crush the city's own interests. A foreign organization admitted at the hearing of a congressional committee of his country that funds were deployed to assist Hong Kong rioters in evading investigation. The CPG, Central People's Government, had no choice but to close this vacuum by enacting the Hong Kong National Security Law to stop the destruction and chaos of Hong Kong. The effect of the law is obvious and direct. Violence has dropped significantly. Advocacy of Hong Kong independence subsides. People arrested 
for offences in public order incidents have dropped by 50% in five months. Stability and order have been restored. People have returned to their normal life. Business has resumed normal. Economy begins to recover. The financial market as the indicator for economic outlook is the first to pick up. Stock market capitalization has reached an all time high up by 40%. Daily turnover has increased even more up by 130% compared to a year ago. The city is steadily proceeding on the path of recovery and potential growth, notwithstanding the downward pressure from COVID-19. The Hong Kong national security law stipulates only four types of offenses of secession, subversion, terrorist activities, and collusion to endanger national security to tackle the actual scenarios of natural, national security threats that rocked Hong Kong in the period of disturbances and devastation. The four offenses are in no comparison to the wide ranging and prolific national security laws that exist in many countries. I must point out that the very first article of the law states upfront that its very purpose is to ensure the resolute, full and faithful implementation of the one country, two systems policy. The law has six chapters. Chapter one talks about the general principles of the law. It has six articles. Three of these six are on protection of rights and freedoms. This includes the rights and freedoms shall be respected and protected as currently enjoyed by citizens under the basic law, the international covenant on civil and political rights, and the international covenant on economic, social, and cultural rights. It stresses on the rule of law, including presumption of innocence, rights to defend, and no double jeopardy. In other words, half of chapter one, the first and foremost chapter focuses on and emphasizes protection of rights and freedoms. This signifies how the law gives due regard to such protection. These are the fundamental principles a judge will take into consideration in any trial. Another point I want to make very clear here is that the national security law makes no change to the basic law. The basic law confers Hong Kong's independent judiciary free from any interference. It gives immunity to judicial officers in the performance of their judicial functions. It confers the power of final adjudication in the court of final appeal. Therefore, contrary to misguided perception, Hong Kong residents enjoy not just the same rights and freedoms that they have always been enjoying as enshrined in the basic law, but also extra protection from national security threats, which have rocked Hong Kong in the earlier long period of violence, chaos, and harm to persons. In Hong Kong, no person is above the law, regardless of status, wealth, political power, or background. The national security law is applied fairly. Enforcement actions and trials are based on facts and evidence. Judgments are made public with elaborate reasoning on decisions. In fact, Hong Kong people have been enjoying more freedoms and rights now than before its reunification with China. At that time, the governors were appointed by the British government. Now, the chief executive has to go through an election by a broadly representative election committee in accordance with the basic law. The basic law provides constitutional guarantee for fundamental rights and freedoms and provides that the legislative council shall be constituted by election. Such constitutional protection did not exist before the reunification. Now that stability and order have been restored, Hong Kong will proceed to prosper again as one of the world's international mega cities. In addition, the national five-year plan has laid down strong support for enhancing Hong Kong 
as an international financial shipping and trade center, developing its innovation and technology industry, and establishing it as an international legal and dispute resolution services center in the Asia Pacific region. Hong Kong is one of the 11 cities that form the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, GBA. The GBA has one of the highest industrial strengths in the region, a combined population of over 70 million and a rich ecosystem of startups. It houses a majority of China's most innovative technology companies. The GBA will be one of the key centers of growth in China. Hong Kong as a highly open and international city complements the strengths of the other 10 cities of the GBA. Markets, businesses, opportunities, and potentials will be beyond limits. Under the one country, two systems, the CBG supports for Hong Kong are all rounded and wide ranging. For example, in assisting Hong Kong to fight COVID-19, a big nucleic exit test support team was swiftly deployed from the mainland to do testing for around 1.8 million residents in a matter of two weeks. And with the support of the CBG, Hong Kong quickly constructed a temporary hospital and a community treatment facility with altogether 1,800 beds in which the mainland bore the full cost. And despite the shortage of vaccines worldwide with the support of the CBG and the country's health authorities, vaccines have promptly and smoothly arrived in Hong Kong about 10 days ago, helping Hong Kong kickstart the vaccination program. The one country, two systems make all these things possible and fast happening with all the restored by the Hong Kong national mm. security law and the one country, two systems fully insured, increasing opportunities at all fronts will happen and grow in Hong Kong, especially those from mainland. I welcome you all to join us and fully capture them. Thank you. In a separate. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Secretary Lee. Uh, as uh, Secretary for Security, Mr. Lee is also mem a member of the Committee for Safeguarding National uh, Security in the Hong Kong SAR, and is literally hands-on in the execution of the Hong Kong National Security Law. So I believe that uh, uh, he will be ready to answer uh, further questions. But I thank him first uh, for uh, explaining, updating the situation in Hong Kong today, and also explaining in greater details what the national security law in Hong Kong is all about and how it helped Hong Kong uh, in its role uh, of maintaining one country, two systems, and uh, addressing the challenges in terms of economic uh, development and also uh, combating COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Next, I would like to invite uh, the Honorable Martin uh, <clears throat> Martin Liao uh, to speak. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, the Honorable Mr. Liao is a member of the Legislative Council and he's also a non official member of the Executive Council since 2016. And, uh, uh, the, 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 Mr. Liao, please. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The need for national security protection transcends history. In every society, be it Asian, medieval, or modern, security comes first and foremost and take a great variety of forms, from word of a king to law made by the assembly. Almost every country in the world has its own national security law. All such laws, are enacted according to the country's own perspective of its national security and adequacy for its protection. By its very nature, national security laws exist to protect a country from foreign intervention, encroachment, and attack. 
not surprisingly, no country accepts intervention from foreign countries when national security is at stake, much less will it any country entertain encroachment or attack on its national security. Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China where one country, two systems is practiced and enshrined in the Hong Kong Basic Law. The Basic Law was enacted in 1990 by the National People's Congress under the power conferred to it by Article 31 of the Constitution of the People's Republic of China. Whilst what one country, two systems should be may differ from person to person, such personal views are irrelevant. It is what the basic law says that prevails. By Article 23 of the basic law, the enactment of national security law in the Hong Kong SAR is tasked to the Hong Kong SAR which may be a surprise to many. What it means is that in a unitary state, the national security law to be applied in a particular region is entrusted to what is essentially a local government of that region. Back in 2003, Hong Kong had attempted legislation under Article 23, but notwithstanding its mildness, the bill could not be carried in the legislature. The attempts had also sharply divided the Hong Kong public. Ever since then, with effectively a vacuum in national security legislation, Hong Kong fell prey to advocates of extreme politics and foreign influence hostile to China. The basic tenets to one country, two systems as embodied in the basic law were grossly distorted over the years. Another attempt to promulgate a national security law under Article 23 in such a polarized society was seen to be too divisive. Almost a quarter of a century passed. In the meantime, Macau, the other special administrative region of China, had long enacted its own national security law under an equivalent provision in the Macau Basic Law. Despite Hong Kong's failure to discharge its duty under Article 23 to enact a national security law, the Central People's Government, the CPG, showed extraordinary tolerance towards Hong Kong and did not press the issue. Unfortunately, this extraordinary tolerance was misinterpreted as a sign of weakness by foreign forces hostile to China and their proxies who had established themselves in various walks of life in Hong Kong. They gleefully assumed, mistakenly, that the decades-long China implosion theory was finally translating from abstraction to reality. This illusion ignited new fantasies. Despite repeated warnings by the CPG, they charted a course to found a Hong Kong independence movement, either overtly or masquerading it under the guise of an indig indigenous movement and a self-determination movement, which challenged national sovereignty, security, and or territorial integrity of China. The Occupy Central movement in 2014 badly handicapped and at times paralyzed Hong Kong's economic and social life for 79 days. In the second half of 2019, a battle was waged for the governance of the Hong Kong SAR, which aimed to control the legislature and ultimately topple the government. It was backed by initially a violence campaign and later by Hong Kong style color revolution using terrorist means, which to the discerning eye was almost played to the script of the Ukraine revolution in 2004 to 2005. Throughout that period, 
the revolution was premised on lies, hatred, and violence. It was not a protest, but more like a war, and peaceful was furthest from the truth. The people of Hong Kong lived in constant fear. People who tried to intervene or express any dissenting view were stoned to death, burned alive, or violently beaten, and their families were dust. Politicians of different persuasion had their offices attacked and burned and received death threats. On a daily basis, banks, shops, and restaurants suspected to be pro-China were attacked, vandalized, and set on fire. Transport systems were sabotaged. The Legislative Council building was broken into, looted, damaged, and put out of use for months. An attempt on the life of a pro-establishment legislator was made. He was knifed close to the heart and sustained grievous injury. Universities became arsenals, manufacturing tens of thousands of petrol bombs. Policemen had their necks stabbed, finger bitten off, legs shot by an arrow, and body burnt with acid or set on fire. Violence was encouraged against family members of policemen, including the children at school. These are just some examples. Memories of the brutal images are still vivid in the minds of many. In comparison, the storming of US Capitol Hill on 6 January 2021 was on any view, much less violence than the 10 months of riots than hot that Hong Kong endured. And yet during all those times, not one single life was lost to police actions, which is more than a lot of the other countries, often vocal in their double standards can say. US, UK and former colonial flags were waved and displayed by mobs during riots and hung from bridges as well as inside the Legislative Council building. The Chinese national flag and the national emblem were publicly desecrated. These are facts that you would never hear from mainstream Western media reports. Without political and social stability, Hong Kong could not possibly undertake sensible economic and social development, which has stalled for two decades. It could not even begin to resolve some of the deep-rooted problems, such as the rich-poor divide, land supply, housing shortage, and upward mobility for the young generation. It was against this tumultuous background that the resolution authorizing the enactments of the Hong Kong National Security Law, the NSL, was passed by the National People's Congress in May 2020. The actual law itself was passed by the Standing Committee of the NPC a month later under that authorization. The NSL was then annexed to Schedule 3 of the Basic Law, which means that it is a national law which applies to Hong Kong either by promulgation or through local legislation. In this case, it was done by promulgation. It is beyond dispute that the NSL was passed strictly in accordance with the law of the sovereign country. The NSL may have some overlap with a few elements in Article 23 of the Basic Law, but it does not entirely duplicate or replace it. In other words, the Hong Kong SAR still has a legal obligation to enact a national security law. The NSL prohibits four types of behaviors endangering national security, dealing specifically with the social unrest, political turmoil, and naked violence that happened in the past few years and no more. And they are secession, subversion, terrorist activities, and collusion with a foreign country or with external elements to endanger national security. It can readily be seen 
that these are but elementary requirements for national security protection. Barely National Security 101 when compared with the sophisticated national security regimes of established countries in the West. It came as no surprise that businesses, local and foreign, welcomed the NSO. The Hong Kong stock markets rallied upon the enactment despite COVID-19. Fake news and false stories continue, as usual, from those who have ulterior motives and dubious purposes, as the notable modus operandi is to disparage China without regard to facts or contrary to the truth, and to employ different standards from those used at home. Half a year after the implementation of the NSL, the initial concerns and rhetorics on its impact have eased. The data speaks volumes on the subject. The surveys published in January 2021 by the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong and the Japan External Trade Organization Hong Kong office showed that most MCHAM members surveyed expected Hong Kong to remain their regional headquarters in the next three years, and there was no exodus of U.S. capital from Hong Kong. Similarly, 65% of the Japanese companies surveyed considered that the NSL had not caused any impact. Only 9% thought that it had some negative impact. In financial performance, according to the records of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, Hong Kong's financial markets in 2020 have thrived in every respect, e.g. the net inflow of capital the strong Hong Kong dollars exchange rates convertibility, a 3.9% increase in the number of asset managers, and a 20% increase in asset under management to reach 4 trillion US dollars with a net inflow of over 200 billion US dollars recorded. Hong Kong is the largest private equity hub in Asia Pacific after mainland China and the number one private wealth management center in Asia second only to Switzerland, globally. For IPO, Hong Kong was number two after the NASDAQ by a small margin in 2020. The NSL is a national law enacted by the NPC Standing Committee, which expressly protects freedoms, such as freedom of speech and of assembly, and has built-in legal principles, such as the presumption of innocence and the rule against double jeopardy. Clearly, the NSL is a stabilizing force necessary for Hong Kong and provides a continual platform for normal life as well as business and investments for the benefit of not only Hong Kong, but the entire world. The stability that has returned to Hong Kong is testament to the benefits of the NSL. Hong Kong will flourish with the mainland as its hinterland, as the CPG has always provided staunch support to Hong Kong. The domestic and international dual circulation economic strategy, as envisaged in the 14 5 year plan of China, will benefit Hong Kong in its proximity and kinship. On the regional level, Hong Kong will play an important role in the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, especially in finance and technology. Recently, the CPG is lending support to Hong Kong to join the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which will facilitate Hong Kong's commercial sector to expand its markets and reinforce the global supply chains. Let me conclude by quoting the words of Alan Smith, former chairman and CEO of Jardine Fleming and former vice chairman of Credit Suisse First Boston, in this article, what the Hong Kong narrative gets wrong. Mr. Smith has this to say. What I call the Hong Kong narrative, promoted by too many in the West as part of a larger ideological battle with China. So often, media portrayals of Hong Kong paint a dystopian picture, unbalanced and at odds 
with reality. And he concludes, in sum, if your idea of Hong Kong is dominated by images of young idealists being oppressed by the state, you are seeing the story through the distorted and very narrow lens of the Hong Kong nar narrative. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Martin Liu. As a senior member of the Legislative Council, uh, Martin Liu shared with us the history of Hong Kong since the, uh, that developed into the enactment of the Hong Kong National Security Law. And from a legal point of view, he explained in greater details of what this law is all about and the reaction, the positive role of the law since its adoption uh, from the community uh, uh, in and the society uh, in Hong Kong, including the business and the, the foreign communities. So thank you very much, uh, Martin Liao. Next, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Henry Ho um, to, to speak and to address the, the audience. And Dr. Ho uh, represents the vibrant uh, civil society of Hong Kong, and he is uh, founder and chairman of One Country to Citizens Youth Forum. Dr. Ho, please. Thank you. National security is of utmost importance to any country in the world. Around the world, Hong Kong and Macau are the only local administrative regions which have been authorized to enact a national security law according to the basic law, a constitutional document for the city. Unfortunately, the legislation was not in place for Hong Kong after 23 years, nearly half of the 50 year period to which Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy was granted. The six month riots in 2019 demonstrated that the threat of national security in Hong Kong was no longer hypothetical and has caused serious threats to law and order as well as lives and properties in Hong Kong. Biased reporting by some media filled with violence, lies, and rumors of protesters directed to the police force has brought this Asia's world city to a halt. It was under this background that the central government through the National People's Congress has enacted the national security law in Hong Kong under the power vested by the basic law. Hong Kong's law and order were quickly restored and people's livelihood were largely back to normal after its enactment on June 30th last year. The outstanding issue in Hong Kong right now is the fight against COVID-19, the progress of which has not been very satisfactory at all. As a think tank leader and a citizen brought up in Hong Kong, I feel obliged to present the real situation of Hong Kong to this council and address some misconceptions by the Western media and community towards the law. In the interest of time, I will pick a few most widely held misconceptions and respond one by one. First, are the cases adjudicated by mainland judges or hand-picked judges by the chief executive of the city? The answer is no. According to Article 44 of the law, the chief executive shall designate a number of existing judges to handle cases concerning offense endangering national security. So all judges of NSL are existing judges. And more importantly, the assignment of a particular judge to adjudicate a particular case is solely determined by the judiciary, not the chief executive, nor anybody in Hong Kong or Beijing. The second widely held misconception is that suspects are being sent back to mainland of China for trial in an arbitrary manner. Of course, the answer is no. Article 55 of the law states clearly that only under exceptional conditions would the Office of Safe for Safeguarding National Security of the central government exercise jurisdiction over a case, including if the case is complex due to foreign country involvement, serious situation where the government is unable to enforce the law, or a major and imminent threat to national security has occurred. Opposition politicians and the Western media have cited the recent case of 12 youths fleeing Hong Kong as an example of human rights abuse in association with the law. This again reflects the bias of some media 
who tend to portray rioters as heroes or champions of democracy fighters. Come on, these people are criminals jumping bail, or what we call fugitives, and intercepted by Chinese coastal police. They are not the so-called political prisoners. The charges of these 12 criminals range, range from arson, possession of weapons and bomb-making materials, riots, and collusion with foreign countries to endanger national security. They have been subject to fair trial in Hong Kong, and no one forced them to flee to Taiwan. This case, in fact, highlighted the widespread concerns in Hong Kong that bail should not be granted so easily to offenders of national security law. The third misconception is whether the rule of law is dead in Hong Kong. Are judges under tremendous pressure in passing down judgments favorable to the central government? The answer is also no. I would like to draw attention to two articles of the basic law. Article 85 stipulates that the courts of Hong Kong shall exercise judicial power independently, free from any interference. Article 89 stipulates that Hong Kong judges may only be removed for inability to discharge his or her duties or for misbehavior. Simply put, Hong Kong judges could not be fired for handing down unpopular judgments. Judges do get criticized, as most people nowadays do in their public office, but they remain independent of political and other influences. In fact, the independence of Hong Kong judiciary has been reiterated by the former Chief Justice Jeffrey Ma. In his farewell speech and the press conference in January this year, he stressed that judicial independence and the interpretation of the basic law by the National People's Congress Standing Committee are not incompatible. Both are prescribed under the basic law. He also highlighted that no pressure has been exerted on him and the judges of Hong Kong in adjudicating cases. As one of the most respected figures in Hong Kong, the former Chief Justice's speech definitely carries much more weight and credibility than the opposition politicians or doomsayers in Hong Kong. And to date, we have seen nobody, including Martin Lee or other opposition politicians, challenging Justice Ma's above remarks. British Foreign Minister Dominic Raab said last week in this council that the security law is a breach of Sino-British Joint Declaration and is having a chilling effect on personal freedoms. This is simply unsubstantiated accusation. We must ask Mr. Raab, which clause of the Joint Declaration has China violated? Which clause of the NSL violate our human rights? What we have seen, on the contrary, is British government violating its own memorandum of the Joint Declaration and its own policy by granting BNO passport holders right of abode. Mr. Rapp also commented on the elections in Hong Kong. While I have no interest in commenting, commenting the parliamentary democracy in the UK, nor the fairness of its winner-take-all voting system of MPs, I hope the British government would also leave it to Hong Kong people to develop our electoral system according to basic law. So, can we still protest in Hong Kong under the security law? The answer, of course, is yes. Hong Kong streets have been much calmer than before in the past year, mainly due to the social distancing measures for fighting COVID-19. Four-person gathering rule is now implemented, as in many European countries. Therefore, we should not mix up the strict anti-gathering rules with the NSL. Hong Kong's freedom of speech, assembly, and peaceful protests are not in any way affected. When our battle with COVID-19 is over, we will see protests again on issues like housing, social welfare, environmental sustainability, etc., in a peaceful manner. The only exceptions will be those who champion for independence, terrorist attacks, or sanctions to our officials, or those endangering national security. Yes, Protesters would be deprived of this kind of freedom and rights, but it should never have been allowed in the first place. In the past year or so, we have seen the executive and the judiciary of Hong Kong discharging their responsibilities in accordance with the basic law. The judiciary has been dedicating its efforts in interpreting the law, which is a piece of continental law in a way compatible to its common law tradition. 
A recent example concerns the interpretation of Article 42 of the law about the threshold of bail for defendants. The Court of Final Appeal, in the case of Jimmy Lai's bail application, indicated in, January, in February clearly that this provision is a specific exception of the general bailing regime. The judges also highlighted that the presumption of no bail was not something new, as they have cited examples in other common law jurisdictions, such as Canada, South Africa, or Australia, where it requires the accused person to establish why he or she should be on bail. In fact, many accusations on the implementation of the law are ungrounded. As to this date, no cases have been concluded and no accused persons are penalized. I would hope members of the international community and media will take a rational and objective approach in assessing the law and trust the independence of our common law judges. On a final note, as a researcher on one country, two systems, principles, and the basic law, I would like to stress that one country, two systems policy is still being fully and successfully implemented in Hong Kong. The essence of one country, two systems could be summed up in one sentence. Hong Kong should maintain a system which is different yet beneficial to China, our country. Beijing has never intended to turn Hong Kong into another Chinese city, as Hong Kong's unique system has provided huge benefits to China. China will be the first to suffer if Hong Kong becomes a socialist city. On the other hand, Chinese government, as in all governments in the world, would not tolerate any attempts of anyone to endanger its national security, to carry out terrorist attacks, or to seek independence in Hong Kong. I am confident that if people in Hong Kong and the rest of the world would bear this in mind, one country to systems policy would survive and sustain well beyond 2047. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Uh, as he said, uh, uh, Dr. Ho is someone who grew up in Hong Kong and understands Hong Kong than many of the outsiders. And as a think tank researcher and uh, from the civil society, he explained to us the effect of the uh, national security law. And also I uh, appreciate in particular the way that he explained and dispelled a number of um, misconceptions about the national security law in Hong Kong. That's something we read a lot from the Western media and we heard a lot in Geneva. So uh, I thank uh, Dr. Ho for his uh, uh, presentations. And now I would like to invite uh, Ms. Jofi Chan. Uh, Jofi Chan is from the grassroots uh, uh, community uh, and he's, she is a committed officer of Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions. She might explain and uh, share with us uh, her personal experience and views on national security law. Ms. Chan, please. Thank you. Thank you for your excellency. For those of you who try to understand what happened in Hong Kong and what is actually happening in Hong Kong, I recommend this book called The Other Side of Story, written by Nuri Fatachi. Fatachi is a foreign writer slash editor based in Hong Kong. Fatachi reviews the inconvenient truth for much of the audience here. Not that our audience does not have the ability to differentiate between right and wrong, but it's because the authentic side of the story of Hong Kong, sadly, is not often seen in the mainstream media, especially those in English. Before quoting from the book to let you have a full grasp of how a foreigner perceived the riot in Hong Kong, I would like to first begin with a shocking story, which was reviewed by Fatachi back in December, 2019. Just to let you know who speaks for the people of Hong Kong. On the 18th of December 2019, Fatachi published an article exposing that a widely quoted anti-China source who uses the Chinese name is actually a Westerner. For more than five years leading up to the riot in Hong Kong, a certain Kong Shong Khan is frequently cited in the English language press, including the Washington Post of the US, the UK's Guardian, France 24, Deutsche Welle of Germany, etc. This Kong Shong Gun, who portrayed himself as a local born writer, is in fact an American and a former Amnesty International staff member. His real name is Brian Kern. Not to mention, Kern was filmed giving instructions to black clad rioters, giving rise to the allegations that he was a CIA agent. 
while it's not illegitimate to publish material under a pen name of different ethnicity, it is reported that Kern fled Hong Kong just before the national security law comes into force on the 30th of June, 2020. Maybe he believes that he's guilty under the national security law. But how many more Brian Kern in disguise? We do not know. No one knows why the international language media, which regularly quoted Kern, did not fact check his identity. Whether intentional or not, no one knows. All we know is the English speaking audience has been hearing the voice of America speaking as the people of Hong Kong for more than five years and probably for longer had the truth not been revealed. We also know that pretending to be a native Chinese spreading anti-China messages for more than five years worldwide would be more than sufficient in painting this false picture of Hong Kong and China. In Fitachi's new book, there's a chapter named A Brief History of Lies in which he reviews the sad history of lying about the numbers of protesters and the Western media's biased policy to present as fact whichever lie makes Hong Kong look worse. Two million was right at the top of almost every report as the number claimed in one of the Black Clouds marches in June 2019. The wider implication is that almost one in three of all adults in the city share the opinions of the radicals, making Hong Kong look as though it is a monolithic community. But this is not the case. For instance, as Fatachi pointed out, a Hong Kong Baptist University survey earlier found an average passing rate of 4,000 marches every 10 minutes. Given the distance of the march, the total claim figure of 2 million could only have been achieved if everyone had sprinted the entire distance. Not only the speed of the marches is in question, there are also other scientific analysis regarding the density of the march crowd, extrapolating that the number of marches claimed were nothing but wild exaggerations. However, the Western media chose to present only the fantasy number. The New York Times, for example, hilariously stole the form of words from discount shop windows and said that there were up to 2 million protesters in an article dated on the 20th of October, 2019. And that's the exact wording from the New York Times. Surely it is rooted in the organizer's incentive to inflate the number of supporters. But what about the Western media and politicians who choose to believe only in the unjustified claim of the black clouds? Whatever the political agenda, what happens to valuing the truth? During the riots in Hong Kong, we often see every camera pointing in one direction to form this false narrative of police brutality in Hong Kong and the violent rioters as heroic democracy activists with a noble cause. In the name of democracy and human rights protection, Radical rioters in Hong Kong were responsible for many vicious incidents, including vandalizing the liaison office of the central government, storming the legislative council, damaging public facilities, beating up a journalist, biting off police fingers, setting an ordinary citizen on fire and killing another with bricks. I was one of the victims too. In October, 2019, I was a candidate for a district council election. The right to take part is set out in article 21 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Yet just because I do not agree with the acts of the rioters, my election campaign office was under violent attack in the run up to the election. Under the mobilization and the encouragement of my political opponent, black clad rioters even came to my office and threatened to burn my colleagues and I to death. Throughout the campaign and even after, my whereabouts were tracked and made known on social platforms used by black clad rioters. And of course, harassment and death threats ensued. Still, these black clad rioters are glorified in the West and have even been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for two years in a row, when in fact these radicals were undermining the fundamental human rights of expression, safety, livelihood of those who refuse to submit to their political demand of Hong Kong independence. With the national security law in place, I feel much safer and my right to freedom of speech being protected. Whereas there's a need for electoral reform to ensure a fair election, and that the election would not be hijacked by black clad rioters ever again. If the black clad rioters were peaceful democracy activists in the eyes of Western journalists and politicians, then by the same standard, those who stormed the US Capitol Hill earlier this year should also be labeled as peaceful democracy activists and be nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Why do the US politicians describe the DC riots as insurrection when the US Speaker Nancy Pelosi once called the Hong Kong riots a beautiful sight to behold. Pelosi also said that the passage of national security law was a brutal sweeping crackdown against the people of Hong Kong. Who are the people of Hong Kong to which Pelosi is referring? The so-called two million people? 
the American voice behind the Chinese persona, the Brian Kern? Doesn't America have its own national security laws? With the same logic, is America's national security law a brutal sweeping crackdown against the people of the United States? Let me give you some facts. Since the national security law takes effect on the 30th of June, 2020, up to the date of the 16th of February this year, only 98 people have been arrested under the new law. 98 people out of 7 million Hong Kong citizens. This figure clearly illustrates that the national security legislation only targets an extremely small minority of criminals. On the other hand, the United States has the Espionage Act of 1917, National Security Act, National Security Education Act, Homeland Security Act, Protect America Act. The list of US national security laws goes on. Back when I was a child in the 1990s, Western media and politicians mistakenly predicted the death of Hong Kong upon the end of British colonial rule. Headlines of similar predictions return every now and again in 2003 and so forth. Recently, Western media and politicians take the national security laws foreshadowing the demise of Hong Kong's economic status. A similar deja vu, isn't it? A prominent writer of Hong Kong, Chris Wing Yin, describes the phenomenon in one of her best-selling book in 2020 as a group of people, rioters, journalists, and politicians alike, being collectively hypnotized. Perhaps this is the best explanation why people are kept being fooled by Western media bias and being manipulated by political agenda. China was once considered as the sleeping giant. By this metaphor, the sleeping giant is now wide awake, helping out the less developed and the less privileged countries with access to COVID-19 vaccines. Please be fair in judging the rise of China. In Hong Kong, only a small minority of people is anti-China and ignorantly seeks foreign intervention into China's internal affairs. And these people do not represent the people of Hong Kong. My humble sharing of the other side and often the untold side of the story of Hong Kong hopes to awaken those who have been hypnotized. But of course, there are always people pretending to be asleep. Thank you very much. And that's my speech.